All right. Welcome to Grace Church this morning. I'm so thankful that you're here. And uh, I believe that you won't be disappointed. I believe that God's speaking to our hearts. How many of you know someone who has held, I know it's not you, but how many of you know somebody who's held on to anger, resentment, and even thoughts of revenge? You don't have to raise your hand. It's so many of those other people. But maybe you've been forced to endure a traumatic experience in your life of physical or emotional abuse or rejection. These wounds really go down deep, and they can leave you dazed and confused and bitter and angry. But if you don't practice forgiveness, you might be the one who pays the most continually. From the Mayo Clinic, there are some health benefits for, that come from forgiveness and forgiving people who have hurt you deeply. First, let me define forgiveness before I give you what Mayo Clinic has brought out. Forgiveness, you know, you hear the words forgive and forget. I'm not really sure that that's possible in this life to forget. The forgiveness part is. But to absolutely bring it out of our minds to where they, it never is remembered again, I'm not sure that that's possible. I know that God can do that. I know that God forgives and forgets. But we're not God, right? And sometimes it's difficult sometimes to totally eradicate memories from us. So here's a definition of forgiveness. It's just general for forgiveness. It, it's a decision. And I really want to focus on that word decision because it is a decision that we have to make. It's a decision to let go of, of offense. It's a decision to let go of resentment. And it's a decision to let go of any thought of getting even. That's forgiveness. So today as we finish up and we're going to wrap up, and my remarks are going to be uh, quite brief this morning to make room for baptism, which I'm so excited about. Um, but we're going to wrap up this series on love and I'd like you to pay close attention. And at the end, I'm going to give you a little bit of a test that comes from Scripture. I'm going to read through uh, uh, an interpretive translation of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 through 8, the love chapter. And I want you to quiz yourself. How are you doing on this area of love? And if you're like me, you'll see that there are many spots. There's not a time that I've read that, and I've read that for over 30 years now. There's never been a time when I read through that that I don't see areas that need to grow in me. And it's hard to admit, but it's so true. And when I put it on the mirror in the bathroom or I read it in scripture or on my iPad or on my phone or any device. <laughs> I see that area and I see this area and then I see another area. Hey, I'm doing better in this area. You probably will have something of a similar experience when we get to that here in just a minute. But again, forgiveness is a decision to let go of an offense to let go of resentment and thoughts of getting even. The memories of that act, whatever has caused offense in you, the memories of that act can be with you a long time. But forgiveness can literally lessen its grip and its control over your life from this point forward. That's what the power of forgiveness does. And if you'll allow forgiveness to develop on in you, because it's not just a one-time act, forgiveness has to grow and develop in you to where you become a forgiving person in that area. And pretty soon it can take over in all areas of your life. You become just, and people will know you, that is the most forgiving person I've ever known. And there's been some people in my life like that. But forgiveness is so important. 
So here's what a Mayo staff member writes. Letting go of grudges and bitterness can make way for improved health and peace of mind. Forgiveness can lead to healthier relationships, improved mental health, less anxiety, less stress, less hostility, lower blood pressure, fewer symptoms of depression. Look at all the benefits of forgiveness. A stronger immune system, improved heart health. Can you see why it's so important for us to learn how to walk in forgiveness and to walk in love? Improved heart health, improved self-esteem even. If you allow negative feelings to crowd out positive feelings, you might find yourself literally swallowed up by these thoughts of bitterness and this sense of injustice that's been done against you. There was a terrorist, just like terrorists today, who was bent on destroying the followers of Christ. His name was Saul, and he slammed into this supernatural experience with God. And I'm not going to go into that, but just to know this for right now, he became a new person with a new name. His name went from Saul, and we know him as Paul. And he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul, being a full-blooded Jew, understood the purpose of the Old Testament. And when he came into what is commonly called a conversion experience, when he gave his heart to Jesus, and Jesus came in and lived in him by the power of the Holy Spirit, when that happened, he began to understand the purpose of the Old Testament and how it relates to Jesus Christ. And that's why God used him to write a good portion, the majority of the New Testament, of the epistles. And he wrote these words. He wrote about the devastating effects of bitterness and unforgiveness. The entire law, Paul says, is fulfilled in a single decree. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you keep on biting and devouring one another, watch out or you'll be consumed by each other. And he's speaking from personal experience because he was one that was consumed by bitterness, jealousy, and envy, and rage. Literally had Christians martyred and killed. And then came into the supernatural experience, became a changed person. And he says, listen, don't fall into what I was. But if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you'll be consumed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Isn't that great? Isn't that good? Some people, you you know them in your life. Some people are just naturally given to forgiveness. They're just forgiving people. But even if you're a grudge holder, how many of you are gr- just, just kidding. Even if that's you, almost anyone can learn how to develop in love and how to be a forgiving person. If you're unforgiving, you might bring anger and bitterness into every present relationship that you have. And every new experience that you have. If you're unforgiving, you might become so wrapped up in the wrong that you can't even enjoy your present life. You might become depressed or anxious. You might feel that your life lacks purpose. Or that you're at odds even with your own spiritual beliefs. If you're unforgiving, you might lose valuable and enriching connectedness with other people. Because that's the power of bitterness. That's the power of unforgiveness. So how do I reach this state of forgiveness? How do I get there? Forgiveness is a commitment. 
of a personalized process of change. Sometimes it happens quickly, but the majority of the time it's going to take a commitment that I'm committed to this journey, to this process of change in my heart. And I would throw this to you too. Do with it what you want. But I think your commitment to this process of change is not easy. And it doesn't just happen. It happens on purpose. That you commit, I am going to forgive. I am going to get to this place where I'm totally forgiving this person, this group, or this situation, whatever it was. So to move from suffering, because bitterness causes us to suffer, even if we're not conscious of it, to move from suffering to forgiveness, you'll want to consider a few things. Number one, consider recognizing the value of forgiveness and how it can improve your life. Consider identifying what needs healing in your own heart. And who needs to be forgiven and for what? On this road to forgiveness, consider getting some help from a support group or a professional counselor. You might be surprised that I've done that before in my past. But sometimes you just get stuck. And there's no shame in that. And there's no shame in getting help. I do ask that you will find a counselor that is in tune with your spiritual beliefs. It can make it worse if you don't do that. If you're stuck and you're committed to this road to get unstuck and to move from suffering to forgiveness, you might consider acknowledging your emotions about the harm that was done to you and how they could be affecting your behavior today. And then do the courageous, brave step and work to release them. And some of you are there right now. And God is challenging you today to get to that place where you can absolutely, with nothing holding back, release that person. And I want to commend you for your courage. Because that's exactly what it takes. And that's one thing you can pray for. And we will pray at the end here today. You can pray for boldness and courage to do that. Choosing to forgive the person who's offending you. Another thing that you can do to move from suffering to forgiveness is move away from your role as a victim. This is really tough. Because there's just something inside of us that wants to be felt sorry for. And we want empathy from others. And we have to choose to move away from our role as a victim and release the control and the power that that offense and the offending person and those memories are having on our lives. Another thing that we can do to move from suffering to forgiveness is no longer defining your experiences that you have from this day forward by what has happened in the past. And finally, to move from suffering to forgiveness, finding compassion, and this is a tough one, finding compassion and understanding and maybe even empathy for those that have hurt you. What happens if I can't forgive someone? You're just stuck and all those things sound good, but you're just not there. What can I do if I'm stuck?
and I can't get out. Again, forgiveness can be challenging, especially if that person that has offended you and hurt you doesn't admit that they've done you any wrong. And that's probably the majority of the cases. I would encourage you to practice empathy. Try to see the situation from their point of view. Very difficult. And say it's going to be easy. Ask yourself why he or she would behave in such a way toward you. Perhaps you might even would have reacted the same if it was you. Another thing that you can do that might help is to reflect on times that you've hurt other people and how those other people have forgiven you. That helps bring empathy to the situation. The thing that helps me the most, you can journal. I, I'm not much of a journaler. Uh, some of you are given to, to journal, and that's a great, great discipline to do. Uh, but what helps me the most is to pray, take a walk, pray, and then when I'm alone, I try to meditate on the scriptures on forgiveness. That helps me more than anything else because I've found that sometimes I don't have it in me to forgive. And I got to go deeper to where there's a new creation, a new person on the inside. And I go down there with the word of God and it feeds that all of a sudden with that scripture coming in, it nourishes that forgiveness and it becomes stronger in me. And then I'm able to release it with my mouth and just say, I forgive you. I got strong competition today. Does forgiveness guarantee reconciliation? No, it doesn't. If the hurtful event involves someone whose relationship with you, otherwise you would value and forgiveness can lead to reconciliation, but it's not always the case. It's just not always the case. Reconciliation might happen, but sometimes it's just doesn't. It just doesn't. What if a person I'm forgiving doesn't change? Getting another person to change is not the object of your forgiveness. Can I say that one more time? Getting the other person to change is not the point of you forgiving. Because you cannot control what another person thinks, says, or does. You can only control what your heart does. And the question is, will I forgive whether or not that person ever changes? What if I'm the one that needs forgiveness? Well, the first step is to honestly admit that I've made a mistake and that I've hurt somebody. And if possible go to that person and ask for their forgiveness. You say, well, I'd never do that. Well, it's this thing in the scripture that talks about humility. And we need to humble ourselves and ask for forgiveness and tell the people that we've hurt we're sorry. You can never go wrong by being humble. You can never be too humble. Biblical humility. So as we wrap this series up, the next couple minutes, on love incredible, because we're talking about God's love, which is incredible, right? Thank you. Three people thought God's love is incredible. Well, I want to go back to those powerful words that Paul wrote to the Corinthians on the greatest power in all creation, the love of God. And as Paul comes to the conclusion of his words, this fabulous text, he talks about the agape love of God. Agape is a Greek word, which means the God kind of love that is not dependent on circumstances, not dependent on other people. It just simply means that it's initiative comes from within, and God is agape. God is love. And that's what we need most. 
is his love coming to us. And we've got it all in abundance if we can open up and receive it. And Paul gets to this point. He's describing this love, which we're going to read in this translation that Rick Renner did uh, a while back. And it's just, he, he knows the language is uh, so well, and he, he did an interpreted translation. I'm going to read to you in a minute. And Paul's going through all of this, and then he says these words. He says, love never fails. Love never fails. It never fails. Everybody say that with me. Love never fails. Say it one more time. Love never fails. And the word there, fails, in the in the in the original language, literally means this. If, if, a, if a soldier is in battle and he falls over from a high place, falls over dead, that's what that word fails means. It fails means. That's what he meant by that. Soldier failed and he fell from life and strength to death. And, and there's people in our minds and people in our experiences that we've held in high esteem and they have fallen. It could be your wife. You know, you hold them with such a high esteem and she did something to disappoint you and they fall. They, her love failed and we all fail. And I've done things to Diane that it, it, she holds me in pretty high esteem most of the time. But I can make mistakes, and when I make mistakes, I fall. I fall from that high position, and I fail. My love fails because I'm human. And you can think of people in your life that have failed. You've held them in high esteem, and they've fallen. They've fallen from strength to disgrace. And they've fallen from this picture that we put people in and we think they can't fail and we're so disappointed when they fail right am I speaking to anybody here oh but here's something that we got to get God's love never fails his love will never disappoint he will always be with you he will always be in this high place. You can put a person there, he'll fall. She'll fall. You put God there, he'll never fall. He'll never let you down. You'll always understand what he's doing. Doesn't mean that you'll always understand the things in your life, the patterns, difficulties, and why. But you can't understand this, that God's love for you will never fail. So let me read this. This is so exciting. So as I read this, again, see it as a mirror. This is the way God is. This is what he wants me to be. His love never fails. He, he wants me to walk in this love so that my love never fails. So what are the areas, I'm asking myself as I read this, what are the areas that my love needs to grow? What are those areas of forgiveness that need to develop? What are those areas where I'm disappointing people that, you know, you can't always please everybody, but when I'm, when I'm responsible, what are those areas that need to develop and grow and become stronger? Well, here we go. Love patiently and passionately bears with others as long as patience is needed. All right, I already failed. <laughs> Might as well not even read any further. No, let's go on. Let's look at the mirror, see where I can develop. Love doesn't demand others to be like itself. Rather, it is so focused on the needs of others that it bends over backwards to become what others need it to be. Love is not ambitious, self-centered, or so consumed with itself that it never thinks of the needs or desires of others that others possess. Love doesn't go around talking about itself all the time, constantly exaggerating and embellishing the facts to make it look more important in the sight of others. You know something? 
you're okay just the way that you are. You're okay just the way that God made you. You don't need to embellish. You don't need to puff yourself up because God loves you just the way that you are. Hmm. Love does not be, behave itself prideful or arrogant or haughty, superior, snooty, snobbish, or in a clannish manner. Love is not rude and discourteous. It is not careless or thoughtless, nor does it carry on in a fashion that would be considered insensitive to others. Love does not manipulate situations or scheme or devise methods that will twist situations into its own advantage. Love does not deliberately engage in actions or speak words that are so sharp that they cause an ugly or violent response. Love does not deliberately keep records of wrong or past mistakes. Would you close your eyes just for a second? I'm not done reading this, but would you close your eyes and let me pray for us right here. Father, in the name of Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, will you come into this room, into our hearts, into our minds, and help us to release people right now and let them go. Every one of us who is holding anything against anybody, would you release that right now? And let love reign in your heart. Let love be the power that you walk in today. And the rest of this is, as he writes, love does not feel overjoyed when it sees an injustice done to someone else, but is elated, thrilled, and ecstatic, and overjoyed with the truth. Love protects, shields, guards, covers, and conceals, and safeguards people from exposure. And love strains forward with all of its might to believe the very best in every situation. Love always expects and anticipates the best in others and the best for others. And love never quits, never surrenders, and never gives up. Love never disappoints, never fails, and never lets anyone down. Thank God for his love. Let's stand. So my question to you is, where are you on this? And only you can answer that question. Are you walking in this kind of love? If not, then stay close. Breathe these scriptures, the most powerful words on earth. Are you practicing the level of love that God is calling you to practice in your life right now, in the, rela in the relationships that you have right now? Or like me, you still got a ways to go. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come in your presence and we say thank you. Thank you, God, that you have brought us your love. And the full embodiment of that love is Jesus Christ. Thank you for him. Thank you for the gift of your son. And let it not just be a story, a story of his life, a story of his crucifixion, a story of the, even of his resurrection. But let it be a story inside of our hearts that when he was raised from the dead, we were justified and now we are creatures of love. That we're different now. We're new creations. And the old is past. The old way of relating to people is gone. The new way has come in our hearts, and we're relating in love to people for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.